Hello and welcome to the Metagame Program, the show where we'll be talking not only about board games, but possibly also about talking about talking about board games. I'm Chaz Marler, your, mo your host, and uh, starting a little bit later today, I apologize if you're watching this live. I hope you can find us. We had to change the URL that the show is at because the connection ID, excuse me, the connection ID that YouTube had on, that gave us to make the connection uh, didn't work. So I had to uh, actually destroy that live stream event and remake it, and the new connection ID worked just fine. So um, another thing that I'm doing today is um, I've been really dissatisfied with the audio quality. It seems that my uh, the audio peaks out and gets really grainy in a lot of these. So I am trying a slightly different audio mic configuration this time. So let me know if the audio works or not. Um, so what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to grab my comments. <clears throat> oh, actually, thank you for the comments there. Audio sounds super compressed. Not exactly sure what that means, but let me change this a little. Does it sound, when you say the audio sounds super compressed, let me know if, you, if that means it sounds like it's way too loud and cutting out or peaking out. Um, that's the problem we've had before. And um, maybe I actually made it worse instead of making it better. Anyway, whew, so after all those technical difficulties and possible audio problems, let's start with today's topic, which is, are two games better than one? And Here's the, here's the thinking about this. Um, I heard recently um, about this neat game called Codenames, which uh, my game group and I have been playing uh, as much as possible. And um, <clears throat> so with Codenames, the way this game works, if you're not familiar with it, you will lay down a grid of 5x5 five five grid of 25 cards, and each one has a different word on it. And you'll have two team captains, and the team captain is trying to get their teammates to pick the words that are assigned to their team. One team will have eight of those words assigned to them, the other one will have nine, and the rest of them are just kind of, they don't belong to anybody. And so the team captains will give out these clues that consist of one word and a number. And a word is just a clue that tries to tie those words on the table together. And then the number is how many of those cards on the table they're trying to get their team members to guess. And um, so it's, a, it's a really, it's an amazing game. If you somehow haven't played Code Names yet, I highly recommend it. But one thing that really intrigued me was I heard that what you could do, oh, actually, let me show this. <clears throat> For those of you unfamiliar with code names, uh, there's kind of an example of the cards laid out on the table with like the blue team guessing their cards and the red team guessing their cards. And then uh, it's one of the neutral cards that doesn't belong to anybody. So you're trying to get your team to guess all these cards, and as you guess them, you cover them up with your team's little, little, little color. So one of the things I heard that you could try with code names is instead of using the word cards that come with the game, to actually try using Dixit cards, or if you don't have Dixit cards, you can actually use the art cards that come with Mysterium. I'm going to show you what these look like in just a minute. So instead of putting down a 5x5 five five grid of words that you're trying to get your teammates to guess by giving them clues consisting of one word and a number, you put down a 5x5 five five grid of these really surreal art cards. And you try to get your team members to guess that. I'll give you an example. Let's open up my copy of code names here. Oh, <laughs> yes. By the way, it's it's never too early to talk to your cat about abstinence. So uh, someone slipped this pamphlet in my code name box for me. Thank you, mystery person. So here. We have an example of the word cards in code names. So what we tried is we replaced those word cards with a five by five grid of just abstract art cards, in our case from the game Mysterium, though you could use uh, the cards from Dixit as well because they're almost the exact same art style. 
So the idea was you're going to have eight or nine of these cards assigned to your team, and then you give one word clues to try and tie as many of these art pieces together as you can. I thought it would be amazing! I mean, <clears throat> art, and they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and art is so subjective, I just thought it would be an amazing twist on code names. So, last game group I was at, when we got together, we uh, got out code names, we played it the normal way the first time to kind of warm up, and then we switched over to the art cards, and we were all completely underwhelmed. It was weird. Um, we were really excited to try it, but immediately after we tried it with the art cards, we all unanimously went right back to the word cards. And it was really strange. Because I thought of any two games to mash together, Code Names and Dixit, or Code Names and Mysterium, would be a slam dunk. Um, but it didn't work, which was really, really intriguing. And I, I th so what I'd like to know um, is if anyone else has tried this, and if your experience mirrors our own, or if it's been different. And um, when you put a comment like that, let's add the hashtag TMG to your comment there. And adding that hashtag to your comment on this topic, of if you have tried code names with art cards from Dixit or Mysterium, I'll go through and, and I'll search for that hashtag when we get to the Q&A portion of the show. And we'll discuss that. But I, I think part of the problem for us, though, at least, um, or anyone that has the problem with this, is that, you know, I guess Codenames is, at its core, a word game. And we found that the art was just too subjective. It was just, the art was, gave you too many options. And what was really strange about that is with code names using the words, you can sometimes, you know, um, try to tie five cards together at a time and get really nice combos going that way to really pick, have your teammates pick a lot of cards all, all on one turn. Because it's really a race against each other to, to find all your cards before your other team does. With the art cards, though, uh, there was so much information uh, possibly on these cards that we were giving maybe clues to match two cards at a time. Uh, maybe three, but usually usually just two. And even then, it was it just seemed it actually seemed clunkier. So I think it's because the art was too subjective. However, it is an experiment that I'm glad that, that my game group tried, and it's one of those things that I don't know if it was just our one-time experience, if other players would have a different experience with it, or what would happen. So I'd be interested in finding out. Um, what your guys' experience is, with that is. In the meantime, while we kind of let the, the comments load up, I also brought with me here today uh, a few other games that I have mashed together. Um, not as extreme as code names with some of them, but um, doesn't really. some of them are just different components. Some of them don't really change the gameplay experience as much. But I brought three examples with me here today. So I was going to talk about these other games that I have actually mashed together and why. And then I wanted to open things up after that for the QA portion, where I wanted to find out, in addition to your experience with code games with art, I also wanted to find out if you have mashed any games together. Have you taken the components or even the big idea from multiple games and squished them together to create a different gameplay experience? That's what I want to know about today. So we'll go over this. Then we'll talk. We'll search for any people that have suggestions or examples of what they've done, and then we'll just open it up to a general Q and A, and we'll see where things go. All right. So the next game that I brought to talk about is trains. Even better, trains. And what I did with trains, um, trains is similar to Dominion, where it's a card game, a deck building game. However, other different than Dominion, what you're doing, you actually also have a playing board. And on this board, you will put down small little train stations, because the board is a map split into hexes. And you'll be putting down these small little wooden tokens for train stations. And then you'll also be putting down train routes in your color 
For example, if I was playing yellow, I'd be putting about down my train route, which would look like this little yellow cube. And uh, trains, trains is an excellent game, but uh, the train stations were little white cylinders, and the train routes were little yellow cubes. And the maps, uh, they have released more maps, at least five maps now, I think. But the original game came with one, one map, and so you were stuck on this static map. And there were different terrain types on the map. So what I did is, uh, first of all, I, I actually have made a video about this um, during a board game breakfast about a year and a half, maybe almost two years ago now, how I was using HeroScape terrain tiles, and I don't have any of those with me today, sorry. I was using HeroScape terrain tiles to make my own maps for, for trains. And that, that was kind of an interesting thing. But then the other thing I did was for the little tr uh, little train stations, I went down to Goodwill to the thrift store, found a 99 cent copy of Monopoly, took the little houses from Monopoly and some spray paint. They started out green. Everything's backwards in the camera. And I took some spray paint and painted those white. So for 99 cents there, I was able to change the I was able to change the little cylinder train stations to actually little house train stations. And that made me feel really proud that I was able to turn those into little houses. Um, I told my family about that for weeks, and they just enjoyed hearing the story every single time that I mentioned it. So that was great. Um, then the next thing is for the train routes, boom, I went and just invested at that point, invested in a copy of Ticket to Ride and got little actual colored trains to use for the train routes as well. Ta-da! So now, when you are playing trains, um, you can actually have the trains on the boards and little stations and kind of have a little bit more of an immersive experience. But So what I did there is I took trains and I mashed it together with HeroScape and Monopoly and Ticket to Ride. And so that's that combination of those four games together didn't really change the gameplay experience, uh, except maybe the really crazy alternative, alternate maps that could be created by using the HeroScape terrain. Okay, so now I have a mess to clean up uh, in front of me. I'm just going to get these out of the way real quick, and <laughs> they won't go in the bag. Mean old Mr. Gravity. All right, actually I'm just going to squish these aside. All right, so that's trains. Another one, which I also um, I talked about in a video, this was probably oh, three or so years ago now, this is one of the first videos that I put together on my own channel, was talking about a game that I really enjoy, Rex, Final Days of an Empire. Now this game, this is an excellent uh, in-depth game based on the old game Dune. It's actually a recreation of Dune because the Dune license expired and Fantasy Flight uh, couldn't get the license anymore, so they changed it to be the uh, take place in the Twilight Imperium universe. So you have this really rich universe, this in-depth uh, area control type game. We have units on the board and you're taking over areas of the city. You have this actual plastic fleet of ships flying around the city, bombarding it. And with all of that work and attention to detail, the units are just little cardboard chits. And it drove me crazy. Er. And so I wanted to find a way to actually give the players units to be pushing around on the board in, instead of just the little cardboard chits. And what came to my rescue that time was the game uh, StarCraft Risk, of all things. It's one of the risk derivatives that they have, and it's just a StarCraft version. And the StarCraft, StarCraft version of Risk had nearly all of the colors that you would need. For example, here's the yellow, and I'll take one out to show you. So for example, I believe these are some little Protoss Protos, uh, people, and wow, you can't see that hardly at all. Um, so. They're a little blurry, but they're not that blurry in real life. But So there's a little Protoss people for the yellow player. And then there's units. Space Marines were used for the red player. And what's really cool 
is the red player also has large units that count kind of like two for one. And StarCraft Risk came with little tanks that could also be used to accommodate little tanks that could be used to accommodate those larger units or that, those two for one units that, that Red has available to them. So that worked out swimmingly. The only problem was that StarCraft Risk and Rex, Final Days of the Empire, didn't have quite the same player colors. There was one color missing, which was green. So for the green, I actually had to go and use spray paint. Yeah, it's never going to focus. I actually had to go and use spray paint and paint uh, some of the, I can't remember what color they originally were, brownish, yellowish maybe, and I actually had to paint those green. And then the other side effect of that is in Rex, these units are the turtly ones that can actually flip over and turtleize. So for this player, when they go into turtle mode and they're hiding, we actually do swap out the chips on the board and then when they unturtle, we put those back on the board. So that's a little bit tedious, but it's still so visually interesting that when we've played, we haven't really minded. We think it's neat. So StarCraft Risk was had enough pieces to be a good analog to update the pieces in Rex Final Days of an Empire. And again, this was kind of just a component mashup. It didn't really change the gameplay of Rex per se as much, like code names did. I'm making a mess. Okay, the third one that I brought in today, again, it's just kind of a component mishmash, is Defenders of That Realm. And this game is a lot of fun and really neat. It's like a fantasy world version of Pandemic. A little, I think it's a little rougher around the edges than Pandemic is, especially at this point. I think Pandemic's been pretty refined, especially with his expansions and things that have come out for it. But uh, Defenders of the Realm is really nice because it's a kind of the Pandemic spreading problem, uh, the, the kind of the idea where you have this spreading problem, in this case, not viruses, but uh, minions of evil, spreading throughout the land, and you have to go clean them up before they get out of control and make it to the Central Kingdom. Defenders O the Realm comes complete with come to me little things nice enough but not really painted or anything little minis that you put down on the board for your character units and I know that there, I believe that there was um, a Kickstarter for either a new version of Defenders of the Realm or an upgrade kit that added new pieces for all of the minions that go around the board. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that included. I, I, I didn't, I haven't got it. But I do have, so I just have the old minions and we just use the old minions. But for the actual, factual little uh, player characters, and there's a lot of them in Defenders of the Realm, if you get all of the expansions, like someone I know who's putting on a show right now did, if you have all the expansions, you have up to this many characters available to choose from when you're playing the game. These are the character, the player characters. I believe the game plays up to six. So even if you play a full complement of players, you have way more units to choose from than you're going to use in any given game. So, who wants to see all of that gray plastic on the board? And really, who has the time to paint miniatures these days? I don't, because I am lazy. So what I did instead, is I went, and I just happened to have a very large collection of HeroScape pieces available, because I may have a problem with HeroScape, but I'm not ready to admit it. Um, the Hey, maybe I'll actually show you guys too. Going through the catalog of HeroScape minis that are available, both from traditional, traditional regular HeroScape and also Marvel HeroScape. This is the big green boss character, uh, the analog for him. He's from Marvel HeroScape. I believe that's Abomination. And so using the HeroScape 
traditional and um, Marvel HeroScape, plus a few characters that we found actually from uh, just D&D &D minis. Uh, you can tell that the bases are different there. They're little black bases, so you can tell these are just D&D &D miniatures. Um, I was able to go through and find a pretty good analog for nearly every single uh, boss character and player character mini in Defenders of the Realm. And added, uh, this is one of the, uh, this is the, I believe, the analog for the red boss character that we use. And we were able to find characters that pretty much matched uh, really closely barbarian character, player character. Find analogs that match pretty closely the uh, options available for the player characters and the bosses. So it's, they still kind of match, which was kind of neat. It, it took a little research and a little time to dig them all up, and, and, and a few of them had to be uh, obtained from D&D &D minis. But using those actually really um, makes Defenders of the Realm a lot prettier when it's on, when it's on the table. And again, though, it doesn't really change the gameplay as much. But one other other thing that we did for uh, Defenders of the Realm is Defenders of the Realm characters' hit points are all over the table now. But the characters' hit points and such are and action points are tracked from these little cardboard uh, chits. I'll show a both sides of one here. Here's a front and back of one. So you have kind of the uh, ready for action side, and the, your action is used up side. And they're just little pieces of, of cardboard there. And that's fine. That's well enough. But uh, I have uh, invested in these a while ago, and I really like them. And so we use these. Uh, these, and I'll show a front and back here, these as well. These are ceramic little life tokens. Uh, they're, a little, they're thicker. They're ceramic. And these show a heart on one side, which is the equivalent of this. And then they show a skull and crossbones on the other side, which we use as the equivalent of that. And we use these for tracking the hit points slash uh, action points available. These are ceramic poker chip sized life counters. I believe they're made by a company called Game Night. G-A-M-E-K-N-I-G-H-T. Uh, Game Night makes these. and. They're some of my favorite components. Um, they make a lot of custom ceramic poker chips for use for game in used for gaming, and I really like a lot of the the components that they make. We also also use these um, for other games such a, as uh, Samurai Sword, the card game that's similar to Bang, the card game. We use these for tracking life points in Samurai Sword because it's really a lot easier to see across the table how many hit points someone has uh, when they have this flipped over to that on the table rather than tracking the placement of little heart, little cardboard hearts with like two different piles trying to keep track of which pile is which. So, so those are the upgrades that we have used for Defenders of the Realm. And so taken all together, that's kind of some four examples there of different game mashups that, that we've done and, uh, and I've experimented with. So at this point, I'm going to try and dig my mouse out of the pile of components I have here. And I'm going to start looking through the comments. And let's see if any people have suggested their own component upgrades or mashups that they've done, and also um, any general questions that come up. So I'm going to search for our fun time little hashtag. And let's see what we get. OK. I'm going to see Joe. Uh, <clears throat> Kabuki Kid mentions uh, talking about our code names with Dixit cards. Uh, they worry that code name with Dixit cards would take far too long. Lots of AP. Um, hasn't tried it yet, but they're just guessing. Yes, that was actually one. Th that was another one of the things that stymied our playthrough of code names using Dixit cards. Is yeah, the play time was at least tripled. Um, instead of sitting there coming up with really good clues and everyone sitting on the edge of their seat, people were getting up, going to the kitchen to get snacks and coming back, and the code givers were still trying to figure out cl code clues. I think it might just have something to do with the way the mind works with art versus words. There's a lot more to look at and think about. But yes, that was one thing we noticed, 
just with the one game, game group and the one game play we tried. Um, I don't know if it would be different with other groups, but yes, it like at least tripled the length of the game. Um, uh, Chuck Polizani, Polanzani mentions that he thinks that Mysterium cards were a bad choice because the art in it is designed to be differentiated, whereas Dixit, you might have a greater chance of linking things together. If anyone knows of any other games that come with art cards that perhaps aren't as abstract or surreal as Dixit, uh, I know one, uh, Blurble. Um, Blurble is a game, actually, I'll be right back. Hi. Thank you for that suggestion, because that led me to something that actually our game group recommended, but I had forgotten about. Uh, the game Blurble, which um, is a game that might be an excellent game to experiment with if you want to try uh, doing code names with art cards. These card, the art in these cards is almost as opposite from the art in Dixit and Mysterium as you can get, because whereas Dixit and Mysterium are surreal, abstract, dreamlike images, Blurble are cards of just things. Focusing, there's a upside down mop, an egg. So this might be, actually I'm gonna put these in my uh, code names box and try this next time. Because with this, um, like a word, it's focusing on one thing, but it's still open enough to interpretation. I mean, diving board, swimming pool, uh, vacation, water. So you still have some room for in interpretation, but they are narrowed down greatly. So if you have a copy of Blurble available, that may be a really good thing to try with code names. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try that next time. I'm actually going to put these in my code names box. And I'll, in a future episode of something somewhere, I'll let you know how that goes. Thanks for reminding me about that. Woohoo! All right. Bob Gabriels mentions Power Grid and Uno. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Now, the tables are turned because I would like Bob to provide me with a detailed description of how that works. So I look forward to your detailed description. It could be video or written form. Uh, even a, a haiku, that would work. All right. Um, <clears throat> Snow Dragonka. <laughs> Snow mentions that um, talking about code names versus uh, words versus art. The thing is that words are much more straightforward than art. You can use different associations, but you know exactly what's written. The art cards mean many different things. And uh, like we've mentioned, I think that's true, and I think that's why blurble cards might be, might be a good idea, because to narrow that down. If you're using art, I think you want to find art that narrows the playing field down a little bit. Um, Colin mentions that he's, he's thinking about if you could combine Lewis and Clark, the expedition, with Lewis and Clark discoveries. Um, actually, that, that would be interesting. Um, you've given me something to experiment with. Lewis and Clark, um, the expedition, is a Euro board game, and Lewis and Clark discoveries is a kind of the uh, next generation of that game. It's a dice version of the Lewis and Clark game. So you kind of have the same world and the same environment, but one's a Euro, one's a dice game. It would be interesting. Uh, I'm trying to think right now off the top of my head of any other dice-heavy Euros. Um, the closest I can think of, and this is kind of lame, is Alien Frontiers, just because you roll the dice and you use them as your workers to place. But um, that's just creating your workers. I'm thinking of anything where you actually are generating, well, I guess they are kind of your resources. But anyway, I wonder if there's any games that are Euro that still depend a lot more, have a lot of dice infusion in them. 
That would be interesting to see. Because that might answer your question whether the Lewis and Clark games would mesh together or not. All right. Oh, Brian mentions something really good that um, he doesn't do a lot of mashups with board games, but he mashes up RPGs all the time. That, that's a good point to, to mention, too. Uh, RPGs are kind of a different animal because, you know, they are role-playing instead of uh, board-centric. But yeah, that, and the, the amount that you can use your imagination just opens that door up a lot. Um, we played a role-playing game once where um, it was set in a fantasy setting. And the characters started discovering uh, in these ancient ruins uh, these basically modern firearms and, and stuff like that. And one thing I noticed, it did, we tried to introduce it slowly and something that could exist in the world and had a reason to be there. But it's still something when you start to combine those two realities or those two genres together, it can potentially destroy the whole illusion that you're trying to create. Um, so I'd wonder what other people's experience with that has been. Because for us, it worked for a little while, and then that whole storyline was one of those that kind of fizzled. It's like, you know what, let's just retcon that and pretend that never happened and move on. So a dangerous territory to tread there, but I'm wondering how, how, what luck other people have had combining role-playing genres in that way. Uh, C. Leon uh, mentions, um, oh, uh, mentions that Bob is making his brain bleed. Um, Bob, mission accomplished. Um, I'll let you off the hook for that then. You don't have to put a video or a sonnet or a haiku together anymore um, since you made Soleon's brain bleed. So, good job, buddy. Um, let's see here. Um, Kabuki Kid mentions that the best crossover that he's seen is using Bananagram tiles to play Snatch since they're easy to read they're more easy to read than the actual snatch tiles. Um, I'm going to write that one down here. I'm going to copy that in the comments afterwards because I have not actually played snatch. Um, I'm familiar with bananagrams, so I want to take a look at those because uh, if that works, that's a really good tip. So thank you there. Cool. All right. Um, Uh, Jason Walker mentions that he keeps wanting to try playing the shopping round in a game of Descent on the 3D board from All Madness. That <laughs> now that could be some really good controlled chaos right there. <laughs> so uh, the shopping round of Mall Madness uh, using Descent pieces um, in, in the 3D board from, from All Madness. Excellent choice. I would like to see that happen. Um, um, a viewer Chuck mentioned that um, a lot of these examples I gave probably are closer to blinging out the game and not necessarily mashing it up together, um, like code names, the other ones with trains and um, defenders of the realm and and Rex are more blinging out games. Um, yeah, I would, I would, that's, that's true. And you've seen through my charade. Um, I didn't have as many examples for this topic as I was hoping to have. And uh, so, uh, I was hoping no one would notice and I could open the door to get people's suggestions so that we could talk about your guys' suggestions. But, um, don't tell anyone though, because I'm pretty sure between you and me, no, no one else noticed. So, all right. Um. See, someone mentions that Dune is greater than Rex. Um, I haven't played Dune, but um, I would like to do a comparison between the two. I think that would be a fascinating uh, discussion uh, of games that have been rethemed, their old versus their new versions. Uh, that's probably a topic to talk about next time. All right. Um, someone mentions that Turtle Eyes is now in the Oxford Dictionary as well as turnification, as they should be. What about a mix of the two, where you have 10 art cards and 15 word cards, says Zach. That's a good question. We thought about doing that as well, uh, mixing and matching. But 
after that first game with the art cards, it left such kind of a poor taste in our mouth. We just went back to words completely. But I thought about doing a kind of a mix. Um, the only problem with that, with code names, mixing some art and some word, is if you truly randomize it, there is a chance that one player, like the blue team, may end up with all the art cards, and the red team may end up with all the word cards. And so it could potentially make the game really unbalanced. And um, so that was, that was another concern. And uh, however, if that did ever happen, it would be interesting to see if the word cards or art cards won first. You know, is there truly a different way our brains work and one is inherently easier to communicate to others than the other? That would be fascinating to see. Okay. Um, let's see, we have here someone mentioning um, one that he wants to mention, a game that Brian wants to mash up is Niet and Euchre. I'm familiar with Euchre, which is a playing card game, and Niet I actually have in my wish list, but I haven't actually purchased, but I know it's another card game. So, can't tell if trolling or serious discussion. So, I'm going to move on. Uh, we have here, uh, Chuck mentions that he'd like to mash up Hopamachus, I believe that's how you say that now, Hopamachus and Too Many Bones. Um, you know what? I can barely pronounce those game names, um, let alone, I have to admit, I haven't had experience playing either of those yet. So I'm just mentioning them just in case other people are listening to this and they go, hey, that's a good idea. So H-O-L-P-M-A-C-H-U-S and too many bones. That's two T O O, not H O L P M A C H U S. Uh, <clears throat> all right, let's continue moving. Oh, comments, you jumped. The comments are being jump tastic. All right. Um, here's another TMG tag post. Um, this person replaced basically all of the cubes in Robinson Crusoe with little sculpted food bits, furs, wood, etc. But they invested way too much into that one. But it looks great. <laughs> there are, um, th there are, a I think, a four different, four different component upgrade packs created by Stonemeyer Games. There's one for. Uh, energy resources, one for food, basically one that has pieces that would be good for Settlers of Catan, one for Power Grid, and such. And I just happen to have one here <coughs> that arrived from a sponsor in the mail. <laughs> so here's the Stonemeyer Energy Box. Since we're on the topic, actually this box does not open. It seals so tight. What you watching on the internet, dear? Some guy trying to open a box. So the one thing that you don't have to worry about this is it falling off your shelf and flying apart at high speed because this box does not open. But speaking of upgrades, this is Stonemeyer Games Energy Box. Ooh, look at that. I can Stonemeyer Games Energy Box. This has and I believe Tom did an overview of these on one of the uh, board game breakfasts real quick, though. But, like, that's a little, looks like a little propane tank. Whee! And then there are trash cans and oil barrels or a black blob when they're showing people on the internet. Um, nuclear waste containers. Look like little bullets. Little campfires. And lumps of coal. Takes me back to Christmas, 1984. Okay, so these, um, again, uh, there's like four different, this is just one of them, there's like four different upgrade component boxes that they make. And I'm slowly trying to accumulate all four so I can do kind of a 
uh, video that shows them all and which games they can go into. But that's something to keep in mind too. If you really want to invest way too money in, much money into a game like Power Grid or Settlers of Catan or Robinson Crusoe. Okay, I'm gonna look for more comments here. Wow, we're already down to like 15 minutes left of time. This is just zooming by today. So let's see what else we can find. Oh, um, someone mentions that they replaced the red cubes in Love Letter with little lucite hearts. It's much more thematic. Uh, that's that's a um, that is a recommendation that I hear of all the time, and I actually received a suggestion by uh, right before Valentine's Day. Someone emailed me. And they mentioned going down to your local dollar store because the dollar store had lots of different sizes and shapes of plastic and lucite red hearts for Valentine's Day decorations. And I didn't get a chance to get down to my local dollar store before Valentine's Day, but that was, um, I thought, a really good tip for upgrades to Love Letter or anything that uses hit points. So ho hopefully um, I can go and find some of those and do a video on that as well. Um, and try to compile a list of every possible game that could benefit from that it would be interesting to uh, someone. All right, moving down here, David, I believe, has a question. Hopefully, I have an answer. David asks, are there any games that you have yet to have a good experience playing but are convinced that it's just a fluke and the game is actually really good? Oh, my word, that is an excellent question. Um, I'm looking at my game shelf. Um, y the answer to that is yes. Um, okay, I got some lights in the way. Um, I, I know this. Um, I enjoy Mage Wars, but my wife detests it. Um, she's not a fan. And I think for, I, I can't really, I can pretend, I can try to speak for her, but I think that her experiences with Mage Wars were due to my unfamiliarity. You know, it was the first time I played it was with her. So I didn't really know what I was doing yet. Neither of us did. We had to look up a lot of keywords. That's one of the, the issues I have with Mage Wars is that there's lots of keywords and also some of the way that bonuses uh, um, are applied, bonuses and penalties are applied to characters is not um, easy to understand. Sometimes a keyword will give a bonus, but sometimes a keyword will give a uh, penalty to a character, and you got to look it up and remember. Um, anyway, due to those experiences, she had really bad experiences with Mage Wars, and I feel that it was a fluke, and if she would try it again, I think that she would enjoy it a lot more. However, it seems every time we have that opportunity, something goes horribly wrong, and she ends up with a bad experience again. <laughs> so, uh, Another game actually, is Battlestar Galactica. Um, I hear everybody praise this game. So many people love it. And I, I love a good, deep, paranoid experience. But when I played Battlestar Galactica, I played it, my first game, with people who play it every weekend for like the last two years. And so they had it down to a science. And it was basically, I sat and watched people play Battlestar Galactica for two and a half to three hours. Um, and so I think that was a fluke as well. So yeah, there are games out there. I think that perhaps larger, more grandiose games might be more prone to this because there's more moving parts that can go wrong. But um, that is uh, that might be a topic for us to explore in more depth later too. Uh, gaming flukes. Um, excellent. Okay. Oh, I'm down in the comments to the point where we, we had the wonderful hold music playing while I was getting blurble. Uh, thank you. Uh, someone mentioned making that their ringtone. Thank you, internet. Okay. Um, someone mentioned, goes back to speaking about Dune. Uh, someone mentioned, speaking of Dune, I ended up basically replacing all components in his copy with wooden discs, a newly printed board, etc. It basically now is a print and play copy with really nicely upgraded bits. That's another reason why I want to track down a copy of Dune to see the difference in the components between that and Rex. I, of course, upgraded mine for Rex, but they started out as cardboard chits for, for the units. Of course, a lot of the other parts of Pete's pieces are really um, upgraded. But uh, I'm wondering how they compare. Did they, did the original Dune, I have no idea how what the original Dune quality of pieces was. 
Um, Bob asks uh, if Chaz, can I describe it in my own made-up language? Um, sure, Bob. Um, I think watching enough of these metagame videos, I'm often end up speaking in my own language to you guys. So don't let it be just me. Uh, join in the fun. Uh, Ed mentions that when he was younger, he did Stratego plus one die six, where you add a die six to the piece number. It's more of a mod than a matchup. That is really interesting. So I'm assuming, Ed, that that means that when your piece would confront another piece, instead of just the, with current risk, they flip the numbers around so, so the higher number wins. So instead of the higher number automatically wins, winning, it would be higher number plus a die six roll versus the defender plus their die six roll, and then after that, the higher number would win. That's really interesting. My daughter is really into Stratego right now, and maybe we'll try that. Um, one thing that maybe I would recommend, no, I wouldn't recommend that, so never mind. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try that. Uh, uh, Jason mentions that a local game store runs Star Wars events that combine Armada, X-Wing, and Imperial Assault with events in one game affecting the others. Each game is played by a different team of people. So they actually have Imperial Assault, which is skirmish level Star Wars, X-Wing, which is fighter ship level Star Wars, and then Armada, which is the big, huge, imperial, huge fleet ships level Star Wars. They have all three of those running with a continuity threaded through each one. If I understood that correctly, that is the most awesome thing that I have heard all week. I want to go to your game store and do that. That is fantastic. Um, I'm just, I'm speechless. Um, which means if I'm running out of speech, I should probably just find a couple more questions and then start to wrap up. Um, so let's gonna, I'm gonna skim here. <laughs> Someone posted a comment with the TMG hashtag just to explain why people are posting with the TMG hashtag. So that was kind of meta. Um, so we jumped back to love letter, made up language. Here we go, back to, <clears throat> comments jumped, but now I'm back. Uh, Bob mentions to combine Formula D with a combat, combat game that has a very easy combat system. Anyone has an idea? There's of course a game Car Wars, which is probably from the late 70s, early 80s. Um, it might have been more of an RPG or a paper and pencil um, game. But uh, if you're looking to combine Formula D but put some guns on your cars, um, Car Wars or something like that might be a game to look into. Um, that would be neat. That's always fun. Um, oh, and then someone else is, oh, it's Car Wars. Okay, people are mentioning that right there. Um, so I guess there's a consensus that Car Wars would work really good for that. Comments jumped again, sorry. All right. Uh, Mr. Coffee Fiend is back. And Mr. Coffee Fiend mentions that off the cuff, he once ran Star Trek RPG landing on a D&D &D world, but using a Cthulhu rule system. So you got like the whole hat trick there. You had sci-fi with Star Trek, you had fantasy with the D&D, &D, and then you had the horror with the Cthulhu rule system. That that could work because with the Star Trek people, Star Trek, you can go anywhere. So Star Trek going to a D&D &D world, I could actually see that working without being too much of a suspension of disbelief. The Cthulhu, Cthulhu rule system could just make things really brutal. Um, interesting. Kudos for mashing that together. That's a really good one. Um, <clears throat> Miss J. Bradford, um, has a question and states, states that it's off topic. Perfect time for an off topic question. Off topic, how old, <coughs> excuse me, how old was your daughter when she first started really getting how to play games? Which games did you start with? This is an excellent question which will probably take us through the rest of the, the episode probably. Um, my daughter's currently nine. Um, I started out with, oh, they're all out in the garage at the moment. Um, they're not Haba games. They're not blue-orange. Maybe they are blue-orange. No, um, there's actually, 
Let me look something up on the, uh, the internet real quick. When my daughter was probably, oh, I would say two and a half, two, about that age, I would start taking her with me down to the uh, game shop with myself when we'd go down there. And the game I'm looking for will be easier to find if I spell it correctly. Here it is. Oh, it is blue orange. All right. There is a company called, I want to just confirm before I go and tell you, Hooray for me. There you are. Board Game Geek Entry. All right. There is a company that is called Blue Orange Games. And they make games that use a lot of chunky wooden pieces. Some of their games are Froggy Boogie, I believe is one of them. Uh, Pengaloo, which is one about penguins. And they also, um, there's one more. I think it was something, uh, a clown, but it was more just a it wasn't really a game, it was more of a toy. But Froggy Boogie and Pengaloo by Blue Orange Games are the games that I started my daughter out with when she was about two, two and a half years old. And um, I would actually streamline, even for those games, I streamlined the rules a little bit. But she was able to get the concept. Uh, Pengaloo, for example, uh, you roll dice that have so six-sided dice, two of them, that have colored sides, so there's no numbers, it's just the colors. And then you try uh, these penguins um, go over these colored eggs. So they're like uh, the Russian dolls almost that kind of snap together. Uh, but um, and so you try, it's a memory game, you roll the dice uh, and you'll get like two colors and you pick up penguins and try to see if they're sitting on the colored egg that matches the dice that you rolled. And if so, you collect that one for a point. And she was able to get that idea down and then Froggy Boogie is a similar one where you have these lily pads, nice wooden lily pads that you lay out. And you have uh, little frogs. And you have, um, oh, it's been a while since I played it. So, But the frogs have, um, the frogs are made of wood. And they, their eyes are also wood. They come out. And the eyes have um, little pictures of frogs on half of them. And the other half on the back of them are blank. So as you move your frogs, you, you try to remember um, you're also pulling the, the, you're looking at the backs of the eyes in the, the, the frogs to see if you're seen while you're trying to sneak by on these lily pads. Um, I'm doing a, not a great job of explaining this, and it sounds rather horrific the way I'm explaining it, ripping out these frog eyes. But um, that game as well, she was able to, that one's kind of a race game, which is neat. So one's more of a memory game, straight up, and one is kind of a memory slash racing game. And we played th uh, those quite a bit. Um, she wasn't like, super you know, into it. She never asked to play. It was just an activity that we would do together whenever I brought it up. <coughs> I think when she was... <coughs> excuse me. When she was four and a half, around four, four and a half, that's when I introduced her to King of Tokyo. And she couldn't read the cards in King of Tokyo. But she understood the concepts enough after just like a game or two, and she started to recognize the art on the power-up cards where she didn't need to read them. She actually knew what they did just based on the art. And there were certain ones she liked a lot better. She liked rolling the dice, and she understood the con concepts. So four and a half, I believe, is when I introduced her to King of Tokyo, and that was the first game that she would come and ask me to play. Um, we also played zombie dice <laughs> together around that time as well. And she, she, that one was okay. Um, and so that's the age range and the games that, that we started out with. Um, so hopefully that helps answer your question. Uh, now she's nine, and her favorite games are Dungeon Fighter, Stratego, and um, Patchwork. She actually asked me just last night to play Patchwork. So that's pretty awesome. And... I, it's gone from me coddling her and teaching her how to play to she now beats me about half the time at Stratego and Patchwork. So, and, um, so that's something for me to start thinking about. I need to start upping my game or else she's going to wipe the floor with me all the time. So there you go. They start out small, but they grow before you know it. 
Speaking of before you know it, it looks like we're just about out of time for today's episode. But we've had a really good discussion. And again, if I did not get to your question or comment in the YouTube comments, I apologize. But you do usually go through and read them all afterwards. So uh, if there's anything else you want to say, let me know right there. But um, that's it for now for the metagame. And from, I hope that you'll join us again in a week or two. Um, we're getting close to Gamma, something of for next week's metagame, talking about a lot of the games that we're excited about for the previews at the Gamma Trade Show. Kind of what's what we're excited about for what's coming up this year at Origins and Gen Con. So that'll be next time. But and in the meantime, please join me again for other videos of more board game news, reviews, and commentary on both our friendly neighborhood Dice Tower and Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channels, which you're more than welcome to subscribe to. And while you're subscribing to stuff, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, on Twitter, I am at Dice Paradise. I'd love to talk to you there. But until next we meet, I've been Chaz Marler, and together with the comments section, we have been playing the metagame. Talk to you again soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.